Hello there. Welcome to my show, COVID-19 Update by Hira. This is July 5th, 2020. Uh, and I'm coming to you from Arlington, Virginia, which is in Northern Virginia. And Arlington County uh, borders on Washington, D.C., uh, Alexandria City, Falls Church uh, City, and Fairfax County. Uh, so, um, yeah, if you ever visit Washington, D.C., you can visit Arlington. Uh, we have the Pentagon here in Arlington. Uh, Arlington Cemetery, a lot of great ethnic foods, uh, especially from uh, uh, Central America, South America, uh, Arabic countries, uh, and Ethiopia. Yeah, so, uh, so if you're interested in trying any of those foods, we have great restaurants in those, uh, um, you know, cuisine specialities. Yeah, so, um, you know, as COVID-19 continues, um, we become more aware of time um, and how time is passing, but how time is precious because we see a lot of people getting COVID and we see people dying from COVID um around 130,000 Americans have died so uh there are a lot of Americans who know someone who died i've shared that my uh, childhood buddy uh Hong Kwang Young David Hong uh from my dad's church first Korean Presbyterian church in Philadelphia he died uh um a while ago COVID-19 is taking a lot of people's uh, lives. And obviously, uh, David Hong's uh, children, you know, they've lost their father. His wife is widowed now. Um, you know, and so uh, that's happening to a lot of families. But as time passes, we uh, understand what is really important our time is precious as we all face death. And we know that as much as time passes, one thing is clear that we don't see any end in sight of COVID-19. As World Health Organization says the COVID-19 uh, is forever, of like how HIV virus is forever. It started and it's still here after decades. There's no cure. There's no vaccine. You can uh, take antiviral medication to reduce the viral load. It sometimes works. It doesn't always work. Um, same with hepatitis C. There's no vaccine after decades. And that's forever. Both of them are 365 days a year virus. The difference is COVID-19 is highly infectious. Whereas with HIV virus and hepatitis C virus, you can't get it just by talking to people who have HIV or hepatitis C. With COVID-19, you can get it just by talking to people who have COVID-19. Um, it's spreading like wildfire. And so um, that is of concern. Obviously, we're now in the, the beginning stages of a second peak. It started when the uh, U.S. Supreme Court passed prediction uh, protections of LGBTQ+, lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, transgender, queer rights in the workplace, which they should not have done. Uh, because as I've uh, mentioned to you, uh, homosexuality is a crime in the Holy Bible. 
Uh, kind of like first degree murder, except it's worse than first degree murder. Uh, so homosexuality should not have any protections or any rights. That's the position of the Holy Bible, both the New Testament and Old Testament. Uh, and that's the position that the Christian church has taken for over 2,000 years. And uh, truly Bible-believing Christian churches still believe that and are pushing to legalize homosexuality in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and the United States of America and throughout the world. Um, Obviously, God's in control, and God will, God will enforce his law through his holy angels. And so I've explained from a spiritual angle, COVID-19, it's God enforcing his law against homosexuality upon nations that tolerate homosexuality or protect homosexuals or homosexual rights in any shape or form, as lesbian, gay, transgender, uh, queer, bisexual rights. So God punishes nations that protect them and their rights. And COVID-19 is an expression of punishment and legal enforcement. Obviously, God will punish until nations come into compliance with his law. Obviously, countries like uh, Israel, which refuse to comply, that actually completely destroyed the nation. So the state of Israel ceased to exist as a nation for a long time. Uh, in the Old Testament period, uh, over 100 years. In the New Testament period, uh, oh, around 2,000 years. The uh, state of Israel has ceased to exist. God was so angry and uh, despite the, the punishment God sent after punishment, the nation still did not comply with God's law. So God decided to destroy the nation itself. So the nation ceased to exist. Um, God is cruel. And God says in Old Testament, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Uh, so one thing you can be sure is God will continue until you come into compliance with God's law. That's one thing that you can absolutely be sure of. Uh, and so um, I am an um, independent candidate for US Congress in Virginia's 8th District, which includes Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and Fairfax County. My name is Hirak Christian Kim, and I'm officially registered with Federal Election Commission, uh, US Congress, as an official federal election uh, candidate. Uh, and um, I am officially running in Virginia's 8th District for US Congress. I have filed lawsuit against uh, Governor Northam, uh, Democrat Governor of Virginia, uh, for not giving me a waiver for 1,000 signature requirement under Virginia state law uh, for independent candidates to be on the Virginia's ballot. So I filed that lawsuit on uh, June 3rd. Uh, six days before the deadline to submit the 1,000 signatures, which was June 9th, because Virginia Governor uh, Northam, who's Democrat, issued an executive order from March 30th to June 10th, which is June 10th is a day after the deadline of June 9th, for me to file um, 1,000 signatures um, of voters. Uh, obviously, um, because of the stay at home order, it would have been illegal for me to go knocking door to door to collect signatures. Um, so I requested a waiver from uh, Virginia Board of Elections and Chip uh, Piper, the um, uh, commissioner, the top person, uh, said he doesn't have a legal authority to grant that waiver. So I wrote a letter again to, um, uh, to Governor Northam to asked for a waiver, he didn't reply yet. That's why I ended up filing the lawsuit with uh, the uh, Arlington Circuit Court, and you could follow along on, on, on this case by going to the court um, website. Uh, everything that happens in the court is public knowledge, all the names of the parties, plaintiff, defendants, 
and that's forever. Every law court case uh, is public knowledge forever. Uh, so you can search any lawsuits because uh, that's public knowledge. And you can also get information on everything that was said in the court as public knowledge as well. Every name that was mentioned, every event, every accusation, uh, every defense, I mean, that's all public knowledge. That's the great thing about the court system uh, is everything is public knowledge, both what the plaintiff says and what the defendant says. So I'm kind of looking forward to uh, uh, you know, stating my case before the court uh, and you can get transcripts or video recordings, audio recordings, um, and um, interested to hear what Virginia Governor Northam has to say. Um, so, you know, you can follow along. It's going to be an exciting summer, but yes, uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is I'm an official candidate for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District, and I will be on the ballot on November 3rd. Obviously, it's going to go through several court uh, cases. Um, Virginia Sheriff's Office has served Virginia Governor Northam uh, officially on behalf of the court, uh, and uh, Virginia Sheriff has served Virginia Board of Elections. So everything is going legitimately. I'm legitimately in the race until November 3rd. I expect the court to uh, order uh, Virginia Board of Elections to put my name on the ballot uh, because, you know, Governor Northam uh, made it impossible for me to collect the signatures. Uh, so I expect justice and fairness uh, to be uh, issued by Virginia Circuit Court or Arlington Circuit Court. So um, yeah, so everything is legit and official. So expect, uh, you know, my name to be on the ballot on November 3rd, 2020. And you should vote for me, obviously, because I'm the best candidate. Uh, far better than Don Byer, who's a Democrat, or I'm running in Arlington's, Arlington, Virginia, Alexandria, Fairfax County, and Falls Church, Virginia's 8th District. Um, he's the current incumbent Democrat. I'm independent. I'm not Republican or Democrat or any other party. I'm not affiliated. I'm an independent candidate. For U.S. Congress, and my political positions, um, I have several positions, but the most important ones are number one. Uh, my campaign promise is to illegalize homosexuality by law, uh, with minimum penalty of death penalty. Uh, I will do that with a bipartisan support in U.S. Congress, and we will. Uh, submit a bill, bill will become a law and president will sign it. And then once president signs that law, police officers throughout all 50 states will enforce that law and arrest all homosexuals in 50 states. Uh, and then the court system will follow the law. Uh, it'll be, they have to follow the law because the court system does not make the law. They interpret the law, but they follow the law. So they will have to uh, issue a uh, death penalty. Uh, and so uh, that's my campaign promise number one, uh, to bring America back to God so that we do not experience plague after plague from God for homosexuality. As you know, Supreme Court justices, uh, not all of them, but majority uh, allowed gay marriage to be performed in 50 states. Obviously, it's not like they made a law. Um, only uh, US Congress can make a law. Uh, you know, court system interpreted in a wrong way, um, kind of like the lemon test uh, by the Supreme Court that's been disavowed. They don't use the lemon test anymore. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, um, that's my campaign promise number one. So if you want to politically affiliate with me, uh, uh, you can do that uh, now or through your election. Uh, your political affiliation with me is protected by civil rights law. Uh, so anyone who discriminates against you for affiliating with Kira Christian Kim, independent candidate for U.S. Congress, can be fined or may go to prison uh, under civil rights law. And any institution, whether it's like university like Georgetown or Marymount or you know, George Washington or, or uh, a business like Apple Computers, uh, if they are found violating civil rights law, 
uh, they can be fined and their officers can go to prison. So yeah, so don't, don't worry about affiliating with me because your affiliation is protected by civil rights law. And, you know, always be uh, proactive about suing those who discriminate against you for your political affiliation um, or your Christian faith. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's my first uh, campaign promise. Second campaign promise is to illegalize abortion um, with bipartisan support. And I'll do that through the channels of legislative branch once you elect me to US Congress. And so uh, we will illegalize abortion by law. Um, so, uh, so that's my campaign promise number two. As you know, I've been actively involved with anti-abortion movements at Georgetown and at, at the national level, like March for Life. I'm very proud of that. When I was at University of Pennsylvania as an undergraduate, I worked with Penn Human Center which is a Catholic ministry uh, at University of Pennsylvania to oppose, game, uh, to oppose uh, abortion. Um, yeah, I mean, the official position is that homosexuality is uh, against God's law. Abortion is, God's, is against God's law. That's the official position of the Catholic Church. It's the official position of all Christians who follow the Bible. Uh, and Georgetown University is the Catholic University, same with Marymount. So they officially hold to that Catholic position as a Catholic institution. Uh, so, um, so that's an official position. And obviously I'm very happy to uh, state that on record right now and in any court of law. Um, and um, the third uh, campaign promise that I'm making is I care a lot about uh, Black Christians and Hispanic Christians. Majority of African Americans are Christians, evangelical Christians, uh, and majority of Hispanic uh, are Christians, practicing Catholics and uh, mostly Assemblies of God, uh, which is a charismatic uh, branch of evangelical Christianity. So I'd like to see my Christian brothers who are African American and Hispanic uh, be uh, kind of, uh, helped out of poverty. And so my third campaign promise is to uh, work in the context of uh, legislative branch uh, to elevate uh, the lives of uh, inner city individuals because a lot of Hispanic Americans and black Americans live in inner city areas uh, through education and healthcare equity. So those are the things that I support. So those are my top three uh, campaign promises that I promise to work uh, with due diligence on if you elect me to US Congress. And I know time is ticking. It seems like yesterday I entered uh, the race to be a US Congressman in Virginia State District in November of 2019. Uh, ironically, uh, my campaigning has paralleled COVID-19. And obviously God's in control, so God must has, have a purpose for that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you know, COVID-19 started in November. Um, I filed for, uh, to be an official candidate for Virginia's 8th District in November with Federal Election Commission in November. So yeah, COVID-19 and I, we're, we're paralleling each other's, <laughs> each other's movements. <laughs> it's kind of ironic, but you know, God has a sense of humor. And obviously um, I have the motto, bring America back to God, so I represent God. And in the same way, COVID-19 represents God. I'm kind of like the positive way God is represented because I'm running for you as Congress to become your congressman. So I could use the legislative branch to pass laws in an orderly fashion to illegalize homosexuality uh, and abortion uh, and to uh, pass legislation that's gonna help lift Hispanic Americans and African Americans out of poverty in inner cities all throughout America in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, U.S. territories, uh, like Guam. Um, so um, I'm like the love of God <laughs> that he has sent to bring you salvation um, through existing uh, networks and infrastructure.
COVID-19 is also a representative of God, uh, but it represents the hatred of God because its sole purpose is to infect and kill. And as we see uh, countries and cases around the world, we see that COVID-19 is infecting and killing in countries which are encouraging homosexuality, legalize homosexuality, but they're not killing people uh, or infecting many people in countries which have illegalized homosexuality and are executing homosexuals through their court system. I've shared with you um, different countries in the Middle East, the Arabic countries, all of which have death penalty for homosexuals. And they, they have 0.1% dying from COVID. And their cases are very low. So their death rate is like a few hundred. Uh, so you've seen that in yesterday's show. Uh, so God is alive and well, and God is acting in history. And um, I guess I'm speaking in metaphoric terms, but also there's reality to that, that I represent the love of God, because I created this show to save you and your children from COVID-19 death. Uh, but I do teach you what's in the Bible, and I will illegalize homosexuality uh, or work toward illegalizing homosexuality through the established infrastructure and institutions and networks and processes, due process. Uh, and obviously my goal is to have 100% of the homosexuals executed through the U.S. court system. Uh, so that is in compliance with God's law. Obviously I didn't create God's law. I'm just complying with God's law. Uh, and the reason that I'm gonna be complying with God's law and for enforcing God's law as well how God wants it, because the Bible is very specific about what God wants for homosexuality. We have Romans chapter two, Romans chapter one, uh, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers, Revelations, Pauline epistles. So, so uh, we need to follow that in order for us not to experience hateful judgment of God. Uh, so I'm just trying to save your life and the lives of your children, your grandchildren. Uh, I didn't make the laws. I'm not God. I'm just following God's law. Um, as I said, COVID-19 represents wrath of God promised in Romans chapter one, or hate of God, hatred of God for those who violate God's law. Um, yeah, you may think that God doesn't hate people. God does. The Holy Bible is very clear on that. And God kills people who violate God's law through plagues, you know, famine, natural disasters, sickness. That's clearly in the Bible. So I didn't write the Bible. God, it's God's word. God used authorized, inspired writers to write his word, to send us his message. I'm just trying to save your life, your children's life, your grandchildren's life by enforcing it. Um, this COVID-19 can be forever. And I'm actually estimating that 30 million Americans will die by 2022. Obviously that's if this keeps continuing. Um, I wish the current Congress, current uh, session of Congress, will legalize homosexuality you know, in compliance with God's law so that this COVID-19 can be lifted. The death stops ceasing. I mean, that's my wish but it doesn't seem like they're willing to do that, unfortunately. Uh, nations do have to come into compliance with God's law and God acts in history. What do you think Christian church for 2000 years have executed homosexuals faithfully? Uh, because they know what God expects. And obviously some of you may not believe in God, I understand that, uh, but it doesn't change the fact uh, that God acts the way he does. Obviously, I believe God exists. You may believe he doesn't exist. I believe I'm right. And the fact is that in reality, God exists. Um, you may not believe that. But do you want to take a chance for this COVID-19 to wipe out like a third of the world's population like the Black Plague did? Uh, which was also a form of divine wrath for non-compliance to God's law. You know, are you ready to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, you may be an atheist, but oh, 
you must consider the fact what if Sirach Christian Kim, independent candidate for U.S. Congress, is correct. That 2,000 years of Christian history um, shows the work of God. The Bible is actually the truth. What if? Um, yeah, I mean, I believe it's a fact, so I am going to, con uh, you know, go forward with that in order to save your life and your children's lives. And this will be done in an orderly fashion. Um, yeah, so vote for me on November 3rd, 2020. Uh, you need to take a stand in order to save your children's life, in order to save your, your grandchildren's life. The wrath of God continues. First peak was reduced and God created a horrific event, George Floyd event, as a trigger to ensure that second peak starts in June. Because if it weren't for George Floyd protests where massive numbers of people gathered together chanting and yelling and talking to each other, it's possible the curve might have been flattened and we might not have had the second peak. Uh, I mean, that's possible. So God plans every detail out in history. So God planned out for George Floyd and the spirit of evil went into that police officer who need George Floyd for eight hours, eight minutes. It was in God's predestined plan for that to be videotaped and for the police officer not to stop me in the suspect for eight minutes so that he would die. Uh, that was all in the plan of God because God needed a trigger our protest throughout America so that second peak of COVID will start in June. God pays attention to detail. And obviously, you know, I am a historian. And I generally hit, interpret history from a professional angle. But I'm also an expert of Old Testament and New Testament, trained in theology. I'm an expert in theology, both historical theology and systematic theology. So when I'm wearing my hat of a theologian, I, I can interpret history through theological lens. And theology obviously includes God, whereas secular history, secular historiography does not. So when we study history from historical theological perspective where God is actively involved, we talk about God as the prime mover. And there's a term called providence of God, which states that God plans out all the details and he executes them. Uh, and so the reason why George Floyd event happened, the primary purpose by God is to trigger the United States of America nationally so that there will be protests nationally of Generation Z, Generation Y primarily. Um, and some Generation X to usher in the second peak of COVID that would primarily target Generation Y and Generation Z. There, it's not an accident that the protesters of COVID-19 are the majority of those who are being infected, not necessarily from the protest itself. That's what triggered it. Uh, it could be in a bar setting, in a pool setting, in a beach setting, other social settings. But first peak of COVID primarily targeted elderly. And you must understand that during the first peak, Generation Y and Generation Z talked to each other. They didn't stop talking to each other. They didn't get infected. But God intentionally mutated COVID-19 uh, because he, in the second peak, he wanted to infect Generation Y and Generation Z. God is very strategic in the way he widens his judgment. And that is a uh, 
certain factor in Christian theology that God's judgment increases with passage of time in the event that there is non-compliance to God's law. So God is following a systematic theological process that has been studied for thousands of years in history, in biblical history. God acts in the way that he always acts. Uh, so law enforcement becomes progressively um, more grave. So that's what's happening. Uh, and that is how it's going to continue uh, forever, possibly. Uh, and that's why, um, theologically speaking, compliance to God's law would be better served if it's done earlier than later. Because from a theological angle, we know what's coming. And obviously, um, we talk about it as a spiritual angle. This theological is an academic study of the Bible uh, along the framed discipline of theology. So it's an academic discipline. When we talk about spirituality, uh, that's more relating to faith. Uh, so both terms can be used interchangeably, but theology is generally done by theologians, uh, and it's more technical in nature. There are technical terms like providence of God, prime mover, predestination. Uh, you know, there are term terminology that has been uh, said in academic consensus among the theologians. That so. When theologians speak, they understand what lingo is being used. It's denotations and connotations. Obviously, there could be variants in denotation and in connotation of any term that is theological in nature. But there is a scholarly consensus. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, so generally when I have this show, I talk about uh, spirituality uh, because most of the people watching this show, even those who are highly educated, uh, are not trained in the discipline of theology. I am. I'm officially trained by some of the leading theologians of the world in the academic discipline of theology. And so, um, um, yeah, so, so I generally like to use the term spiritual because whether you have a PhD in physics, nuclear physics, or whether you have just an elementary education, uh, spirituality applies to you because you may not understand theology, which is a technical academic discipline. Um, so in simple words, spiritually speaking, uh, Romans chapter 1 uh, promises that God will uh, send wrath of God, uh, punitive measures uh, for non-compliance to God's law, which is uh, not engaging in homosexuality and opposing homosexuality are required in the Bible. So non-compliance to either one of those, obviously engaging in homosexuality is far more serious than uh, tolerating homosexuality by law uh, or defending the rights of homosexuality, which is more serious than just mere toleration because God's law uh, does not treat all violations equally. Some violations are more uh, serious. And you see that in Westminster Confessions. You see that in Heidelberg Catechism. You see that in Catholic Confessions. You see that in the Bible. Not all sins are equal. Um, some sins are more heinous than others. And so... Um, Homosexuality is considered the greatest evil and greatest sin, the greatest crime in the Holy Bible. Uh, so the Bible expects compliance. And that's why the Catholic Church refuses to ordain any homosexual, recognizes that no homosexual will eternal life, that no male-to-male -male or female-to-female -female marriage can be conducted uh, as a holy matrimony. 
is a violation of God's fundamental law. Uh, so until America comes into compliance with God's law, you should expect the wrath of God to be operative against America and every U.S. citizen. Uh, and that's why I'm running for U.S. Congress, uh, so that I go to Congress and with bipartisan support, illegalize homosexuality in the way God wants it to be legalized because the moral code of God, the Bible is applicable um, in the world, regardless of political system, whether you're communist, fascist, socialist, democracy, capital, uh, like monarchy, you need to illegalize homosexuality with minimum sentence of death. Just, it's required by God. Until you come into compliance to that, you should expect horrible things to happen uh, at the hand of God, uh, what Romans chapter one calls wrath of God. And that's why I'm running for US Congress and I shifted my focus a little bit more to accommodate the present reality. As I said, COVID-19 started at the same time that I started running for office in November. And I represent the love of God in theological terms. COVID-19 represents the, the hatred of God. Um, yeah, so um, there's heaven and hell, there's love and hate. God uses, he generally uses dualities in the world to operate. Um, yeah, so you should vote for me. Uh, I'm, you know, obviously you don't have to vote for me, you do what you want, uh, but we do need to illegalize homosexuality as a nation. Whether I do it or someone else do it, it has to be done to come into compliance with God's law. As I said, it doesn't matter what legal system you have, what political system you have, you have to submit to God's law. Because at the end of the day, God will enforce his law through his holy angels. So what are you gonna do when God starts enforcing his law? You can't see his holy angels. Um, only option we have is compliance, you know, or, or death, or destruction. Um, so I, I recommend compliance to God's law. Uh, and I say this as an expert theologian uh, who has vast knowledge of theology. Uh, so I, I, I recommend this to you as Congress as an expert theologian. Um, obviously, you reject expert advice in key matters, you would do that to your detriment. Simple as that. I recommend US Supreme Court coming to compliance with God's law. And as I said, second peak started with US Supreme Court decision not to enforce God's law in the United States of America. God will use his methodology to enforce his law. And look what's happening now. There's always cause and effect. In the natural world, as well as in the spiritual world, there's always a cause and effect. You have to trigger something. And you will see in the coming days, weeks, and months, the horrific ways God moves history. You will see. You haven't seen anything yet. God hasn't even started. God's been kind. That's why the sooner you come into compliance with God's law, the better. Because God never loses. He's almighty God. And God is spirit. You can't see him. And he will enforce his law without mercy. That's why he destroyed Israel in the Old Testament. And then he destroyed Israel in the New Testament. That's who God is. He's merciless. When he starts the day of the Lord. Read the Hosea uh, reference to the day of the Lord. Amos reference to the day of the Lord. See, to see how merciless God is once the day of the Lord starts.
arts. Now let's go to COVID-19 uh, cases and deaths. Uh, as you know, uh, we are in um, July 4th holiday, and this nation was created uh, to honor God. So during this Independence Day weekend, uh, we see that God is kind of celebrating our nation as a nation that could be a Christian nation. He started out as a Christian nation. Um, and we can go back to that. That's why I'm running for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District. My motto is bring America back to God. So even in the midst of tragedy, God is giving us hope. Uh, but in the midst of giving us hope in 231 death, God also reminds us what we can lose. As we see Nick over there, uh, Broadway star, Nick Cordero, he has died of COVID-19 after suffering weeks and weeks, over four months, he started suffering with COVID four months ago, and now he has died from it. As I said, you know, the new cases of COVID uh, now, that we see 10,000 plus cases in Florida every day, it's gonna take at least two to three weeks to start seeing deaths. Some of them will take 13 weeks to die. Almost no one will die like right away because your condition has to get worse and worse. And if you're in a hospital, your rush to death slows down. So whereas if you didn't go to hospital, you may die in a week. You go to hospital, you, you will take one month to die. And some of you may live. And that's why we're not seeing the spikes in death yet. It's coming in two to three weeks. You'll see thousands of people die. We know this because hospital beds are filling up. ICU beds are filling up. People are getting intubated. And I see you, I see you. I see you generally intubates people, puts breathing tube down on you. So we know death is coming. And that's why we can say with confidence that thousands, thousands, thousands of people will die per day in the coming weeks. Because hospital beds are filling up. ICU rooms are filling up. As I said, people are not sent to ICU unless they're about to die. Some live, but then you die. And this is happening in many states. So uh, as Dr. Gottlieb today said in Face the Nation, in the first peak, we only had one epicenter, New York. The second peak right now that's happening, we have multiple epicenters, California, Texas, Florida, Georgia, Arizona, and other, other states are becoming epicenters. So that's why you, you can expect far worse deaths in the second peak than the first peak. All the experts expect it, and you should prepare yourself. Um, and obviously God sends us signs. The reason that Nick Cordero died at this particular moment is a sign to remind all of us, to remind you that death is coming, lest you forget. He's a very famous guy. And he was in need of double lung transplant. That's how, how destroyed his lungs became. COVID-19 can destroy your lungs. He can coagulate your blood, meaning thicken your blood so that you have heart attack or a uh, stroke, which is your blood vessels in your brain getting blocked. Clock is ticking. And at a certain point, the clock will stop. Like it did for Nick Cordero. And then you'll be standing in front of your maker 
and your maker will send you to eternal damnation in hell or eternal life in heaven based on whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not. So today, the death toll stands at 129,904. Um, the total number of cases stand at 2,880,130. It will probably double or triple uh, in the second peak. Uh, I, here at Christian Kim, independent candidate for U.S. Congress, is predicting that one million Americans will die by end of August. You think it's a short period. It's not. From May, March to May, Virginia's stay in order started on March 30th. And it went to June 10th. In that period, Many Americans died in that short period of two months. Many Americans died. And we basically had one epicenter in New York. As Dr. Gottlieb pointed out, now we have many epicenters. And so I don't think I'm wrong to predict 1 million people to die. By end of August, I think that is scientifically feasible. I think Dr. Gottlieb would agree with me that's possible. I believe that Dr. Fauci would agree with me that that's possible, that Dr. Han would agree with me. Um, and Dr. Redfield would agree with me that that's a possibility from a scientific perspective. Because every single COVID case can end up in death. Right now the death rate is 5%, but if you run out of ICU beds, you run out of nurses, people can die. Today, I was watching news on CNN and one of the experts was saying, we can always create hospital beds, but we cannot create nurses. So yes, we're running out of hospitals. We could always build a tent, create more beds, but all the nurses are stretched now beyond limit in Texas like in cities like Houston and Austin, which, are, you, which have either reached or are reaching capacity in their hospitals. And his argument is, yeah, we can always create more beds, rooms with more beds, but we cannot create more nurses. And that's why he's worried. Um, and that's absolutely right. That's why you, many people are gonna die. I mean, obviously you need a ventilator. If you don't have a ventilator, you're gonna die if you need a ventilator, or whether you have a nurse or not. But for those people who could have survived, were there enough nurses, they will not survive because there are not enough nurses. And that's the point that he made, and I think he made it well. Because th that's true. Shortage of nurses means death. I mean, I took, spent two years learning the skills and principles uh, with my core members, a clinical nurse leader, 2020 from Georgetown University, and it was incredibly hard two years. There was no life outside of that program, basically, for most people. Uh, as clinical nurse leaders, uh, no. There are 25 of us. We started out with 34, nine are no longer here with us. Uh, so I want to celebrate my clinical nurse leaders. CNL, 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 2020, Georgetown University, we did it, yay! We had the pinning ceremony, we had the graduation ceremony, yay! Maybe not all of us, 25 people will make it to August, but we at least made it to pinning ceremony, yay! I can't lie, I'm sorry, but because we're facing COVID, we don't need any more lies. I know a lot of people lie, lie that just to get by. But, you know, the white lies, you know, they say grease is the wheel. But you're facing death. You may die. 
before August? I mean, do you really want to lie when you, you may die by August or before August? Or you may die before Christmas? I mean, do you want to live a lie? It's ridiculous. That's why I'm not going to lie to you. I am aware, just as all the nursing professors at Georgetown, that some of the clinical nurse leader students who go to hospital for clinicals for the next four to six weeks can get COVID and die. We're in, we're beginning second peak, but it's going to be going higher. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, I hope none of them die, obviously, but they can. So that's why I can't honestly say we're going to have 25 people in August. Because, you know, you know how you have a sick feeling that something's going to happen? I have that feeling in my stomach that one or two will die. And I may be wrong, you know, I hope so. Maybe it's just what I ate for dinner. Um, but I, I, I don't think anybody doubts that they can die. I mean, obviously, Georgetown University forced everybody to sign a waiver saying, we will not hold the Georgetown University responsible if we die. So by definition, they're expecting potential death. So it's not like I'm saying something that Georgetown University doesn't expect to happen. Because they obviously they made them sign a waiver saying that if they die, they're not going to hold Georgetown University responsible for going to clinicals. You know what the contract says, the, the waiver document says, Georgetown University explained to me that there are other ways to fulfill clinical requirements. I understand that, but I, I decide not to use the alternative methods to fulfill my requirements for graduation, but um, to actually go to the hospital setting. Since I have chosen to make, take the risk on my own, if I get sick, I am responsible for it. Any medical bills I have to pay, Georgetown is not responsible for it. And if I die, Georgetown is not responsible. It's, it's that kind of wording, right? So obviously, um, you know, uh, that kind of made me pause. And when Billy said he's not going to go to the hospital, because, uh, you know, um, made me think. And so Billy opted out. I Billy from Texas opted out. I hope his family's not gonna die. I hope nobody. I mean, he has all his family there in Texas. I mean, I think I mean, some of them may die. I mean, geez, because Texas, you know, I heard everybody's you know like COVID nineteen is filling up. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I worry about his family. I'm sure he's worried about it more than I am. But uh, yeah, Texas is an epicenter. Um, like near 10,000 cases a day, right? Eight, eight to 10,000 cases a day. So uh, yeah, so Billy's opting out. I'm opting out. Grant from North Carolina is now in South Carolina. And they're becoming epicenters. Both North Carolina and South Carolina are beginning to become epicenters. So um, yeah, so he opted out. So three of us guys, there are only three guys in the whole program, cohort of 25. There are only three guys. All of us opted out. Uh, and then... Um, I think like three women opted out, you know, the 19 of them are going to hospital tomorrow. Uh, obviously, I hope no one gets COVID, Keep, keeping my fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, so like I can't do the same cheer that I did before because, um, you know, in good conscience, I, I cannot, you know, because, you know, because we're like Marines. It's like Marines rushing Normandy saying, oh, all of us are going to come back alive. That's not true. Everybody in the Marines who rushed Normandy knew people were going to die. They didn't know who was going to die, but they knew someone was going to die. And you just have to be realistic about this. You can't, as first responders, expect to live, everybody to live. It's just, you know, if you want everybody to live, choose something else, you know? Like, don't become a Marine, you know? Um, yeah, so um, same with nurses from COVID-19. If you don't want to die... Don't become a nurse. Because if you treat COVID-19 patients for 12 hours, your chance of getting COVID is very high. You know? So if you don't want to die, you shouldn't become a nurse. Right? Does that make sense to you?
Yeah, I mean, obviously, like everybody who started this clinical nurse leader program in 2018 did not expect to be in the middle of a pandemic and graduation. So none of them expected to die being a nurse. In fact, before COVID-19 started, being a nurse was probably the safest job. I mean, how many nurses have you heard of who died in, while working as a nurse? It's not like being a police officer, being shot at a, by criminals or being a soldier, right? Or even like in construction, you know, there's a lot of accidents that kill them. Um, but yeah, I mean, nurses, how many of them die in, in, you know, just in the work? I mean, almost never. Um, so, um, yeah, so when, when we started in 2018, two years ago, uh, nursing was probably the safest job. Nobody expected to die from it. But now it's the most dangerous job in America. It's more dangerous than being a Marine. There's more chance that you'll die as a nurse than there's a chance that you'll die as a Marine. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, but obviously, you know, I want to save lives. That's why I went into uh, nursing. And so I'm looking forward to working as a full-time nurse, uh, you know, helping out with COVID patients in August. Uh, so I'm interviewing for positions right now. Uh, I had an interview on Friday as well, or, or Thursday. Uh, Friday was a holiday, but so, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited, you know. Um, obviously, you know, I follow the call of the Lord. Um, so uh, God guides me through my life. And, you know, I'm open to that and I pray. I, I talk with God. Prayer is talking with God, right? God's alive. God communicates with you, right? Uh, for those of you who pray, you know what I mean. Uh, and so, um, yeah. Uh, let's look at Africa. Africa is a continent where they execute homosexuals. Uh, obviously, uh, there are countries that are more conservative than others. Uh, Africa is generally divided among Christians and Muslims. So, like Nigeria has 50% Christians and 50% Muslim. Both Christians and Muslims believe that homosexuality should be illegal, that homosexuals should be sent to prison or executed. Uh, both Muslims and Muslim, uh, Christians. So, 100% of the populations agree on that. Um, so, let's go down the list of um, uh, top five. Uh, cases in Africa, and you can see why God is punishing America for homosexuality. It's self-evident. We, we hold this truth to be self-evident that God kills citizens of countries that legalize homosexuality. That is self-evident. You know how we say we hold these truths to be self-evident? This is one of these truths that we hold to be self-evident because we can see it, right? When we say we hold this truth to be self-evident, what we're saying is, we can see these truths. Like everyone can see this truth, regardless of education level. They can look at the numbers and they can see the truth, which is self-evident. So that's why I'm saying we hold these truths to be self-evident that every country that legalizes homosexuality has greater COVID-19 death. It's a self-evident truth. Do you see what we mean when we say we hold these truths to be self-evident? Self-evident means you can see it. No one needs to explain it to you. Uh, so uh, number one, South Africa. They have 196,750 cases. Death stands at 3,199. 2% of the cases are ending in death. U.S. Our rate is currently at 5%. It may go down, it may go up. Let's see what happens in the coming weeks. It's going to be far worse than March and April. Um, number two, Egypt. There's 75,253 cases. Uh, that's ending up in 3,343 deaths. That's 4%. So Egypt has fewer cases, but more death, around the same number of deaths. So that's why their death rate is at 4%. So you can see we are at 5%. Uh, so the percentage of cases and ending up death uh, makes a significant difference in terms of how many people will die. So by the time that Egyptians have 196,750 cases, they'll have like something like uh, 6,600 cases of deaths. You see how that works? 
Number three is Nigeria. They have 28,711 cases, only 645 deaths. 2% are ending in, in death. Ghana uh, has 20,085 cases, 122 are ending up in death, less than 1%. And we saw that in Arab countries, many countries are less than 1%. Because Arab countries are 100% Muslim and they're more strict about observing God's law than mandatory death penalty for homosexuals. And that's why God favors Muslim countries. Because obviously Jews, Christians, Muslims all follow Ten Commandments, but Muslims have been very faithful in executing Ten Commandments to the letter. And although you need to believe in Jesus Christ to go to heaven, on earth, when God's angels enforce God's law, is strictly based on observance. It's like any legal code. It doesn't matter what you think or believe, it's compliance. And so that's what, what's operating here. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you love Jesus, God's law will be enforced based on whether you're keeping the law, the letter of the law. So what you feel about Jesus is irrelevant. You could love Jesus all you want. If you are not in compliance with God's law and you don't repent, you'll receive the judgment of God. So that's how laws work. See, do you see why theology is important? Because unless you are studying theology at a very high level, you can't understand the difference between going to heaven and being punished on earth. You can love Jesus, you can be truly born again, and you may go to heaven, but if you're not fully complying with God's law, God will punish you on this earth for non-compliance. Have you heard that from your pastor? Well, he should have taught you that because that's in the Bible. Obviously, theologians systematize it um, because it's an academic discipline and systematization is important in academic disciplines. Algeria is uh, number five with 15,941 cases and the death rate is 952. Uh, and so they have 6% death. Um, but, you know, they don't have many cases, there are many deaths. And Algeria is, as you know, a little bit more relaxed uh, about homosexuality um, because, I mean, they still execute homosexuals, but, um, yeah, they, you know, they, they don't always enforce it like they do in, like, Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, yeah, because Algeria was a colony of France. That's why. Um, now, um, there is an outbreak right now uh, among fraternity houses in University of Washington. As you know, that's where everything started in America in terms of first peak. And now they're about to experience a second peak, uh, which shows us that New York can also have a peak as well. And, you know, we expect New York to have a second peak. And for just as many or more people to die in the second peak in New York, I think everybody expects that to happen. It's just a matter of time. Um, and I think Governor Cuomo understands that too. Uh, it's a matter of time before Second Peak hits New York. And so we see uh, Second Peak starting in uh, uh, University of Washington and a um, lot of people getting infected. Living in close quarters that will infect a lot of people. So we're seeing that. Um, uh, yeah, so we're in this now, but obviously, as World Health Organization says, this will continue forever. And I've, as I've pointed out, it's going to get progressively worse. Spiritually speaking, because God likes to, to add punishment upon punishment for continued non-compliance. You know, the punishment gets incrementally worse or more severe. That's the way God works. Um, and in Israel, it becomes so severe, God just destroyed the whole nation, wiped the country out of the map for like 100 years. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah, God does that sometimes. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, you can look forward to a lot of things happening in the future. God is an eternal being. He's in no rush. Uh, you know, he could take 10 years uh, with no vaccine effectively working, being created, uh, you know, he, he, he is eternal being. He, he can wait forever. He could do this like slowly 
over like 10 years, over 50 years. Yeah, he's, he's eternal being. He doesn't really, you know, our sense of time is a little bit different from his sense of time. That's why he made Israelites wander in the desert for 40 years. I mean, everyone who came out of Egypt died. Only people who were born in, in the desert were able to enter into uh, the promised land. 40 years is a long time. And it's a journey that should have taken them 40 days, month and a half. And God made them wander around in the desert for 40 years. That's how cruel God is. Yeah. For them to suffer and suffer and then die in the desert without seeing the promised land. That's how cruel God is. Um, yeah. So don't expect God to show you mercy unless you're complying with God's law. Only way God's going to show you mercy is if you come into compliance with, to, compliance with God's law. If you do not comply with God's law, do not expect God to be merciful to you. Because God is not merciful to those who violate his law. It's absolutely clear in the Bible. As I said, God made his Israelites chosen people wander around or in the desert for 40 years because enough of them were not complying with God's law. That's how cruel God is. He will not let them see the promised land. And the whole purpose of bringing them out of Egypt was to send them to the promised land. And he will not let them go to the promised land because enough of them were violating God's law. That's just who God is. So don't expect God to be merciful to you unless you come into compliance with God's law. God's not going to show you love because God's love is always conditional. Unless you're complying with God's law, don't expect God's love to operate with, with you and your family and your children. Only thing that's going to show God's mercy is compliance. God is a very legal entity, legal personality, legal being. That's what God gave Moses, the law. God is eternal. He doesn't change. He expects these law codes to be observed. Um, yeah. Sooner you comply with God's law, better it's going to be for you, your family, your children. Very simple as that. Um, yeah. So is historical direction changing? Is there going to be a paradigm shift? As you know, I'm a professional historian trained at UCLA in the PhD program there. And historians always talk about paradigm shifts. So a paradigm shift in Jewish history was Hanukkah. There used to be legitimate priests of Jerusalem temple who are called Zedukai priests who were descended by blood, through the bloodline from the first priest, Zedek, who was the priest of David, uh, who became the high priest in Solomon's temple. And after that, all the high priests were Zedekites. But in the Maccabean revolt, these country bumpkin priests called Maccabees, they usurped the office of the high priesthood, and they weren't Zedekites. Uh, and then they claimed that office for themselves. And we call that a paradigm shift because for hundreds of years, Zedekites, bloodline of Zedek, were high priests in Jerusalem temple. And then after the Maccabean revolt, basically that's Hanukkah, non-legitimate priests, non-Zedekite priests, became high priests of the Jerusalem temple. So we call that paradigm shift because obviously, uh, history of Israel shifted from legitimate priesthood to the illegitimate priesthood. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, um, uh, legitimacy is defined by the Jewish text, right? That was operating until the illegitimate priest took over. And then we talk about the illegitimate priest tried to rewrite history by destroying statues and monuments uh, that were, were uh, established in honor of the legitimate priests. Yeah, illegitimate people always destroy monuments. That's what they do. Right? It happens in history again and again. When people are destroying monuments, you know there's something wrong going on. 
Yeah, that's how you know when something is not right in a nation. When people start destroying monuments from the past. That by definition is chaos. That by definition is discontinuity. By definition is paradigm shift. Uh, obviously, you know, when, when a country tries to dissociate itself from its past, it often sounds a death knell of that country. It just Because every nation, every people, every institution needs continuity. Without continuity, people cannot exist. Nation cannot exist. Uh, institutions cannot exist. It's just by definition. Um, and we see that in history. Uh, and in science, we have a term for that called entropy. Like anything that is a viable organism, uh, the moment it's, it's not able to maintain its continuity, it starts degenerating, and then it goes to destruction. It's kind of like aging. Every person is born, and then they're living in a continuity, right? They're growing, right? They're able to maintain their growth. Uh, but at a certain point in the aging process, your body starts to degenerate, uh, you become weaker, you go through menopause, uh, and you know that death is coming closer to you because you're losing muscle mass, you know, bone density, you know, and so there's a type of entropy that happens in the human body. Uh, and so, um, so whenever um, there's a paradigm shift, uh, whether at a social level or body politic level or an individual organism level, uh, you know that, that there could be problems, right? Um, yeah. So, so I am just throwing this question out there. I'm, I'm sure we need more time to talk about this. Um, but I want to introduce the concept of paradigm shift so that in the future when you see this show, uh, you kind of are familiar with it, so I could take you a little bit further in your intellectual development in terms of understanding why paradigm shift is in history. Uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm introducing the term, technical term, um, so that uh, you know, you're kind of initiated into historical discourse. Now, uh, first article is called uh, the third highest single day total 10,059 pushes for the past 200,000 COVID-19 cases. At the current rate of 5% dying, obviously uh, you're expecting uh, 10,000 to die in Florida from that number alone. Obviously, they're gonna add like 10,000 every day, so in 10 days it'll be 300,000, uh, in which case you expect about 15,000 to die in Florida at that total of 300, 15,000 would die at some point, uh, so the, the percentage will remain constant or is kind of expected to remain constant at this point. Obviously, if ICU beds run out, nurses run out, the death rate will go up. So we can go from 200,000 cases to 300,000 cases at the normal level 5% death. You expect 15 to die, but if you run out of nurses, you run out of ventilators, you run out of PPEs, you run out of hospital beds, you may have 50 people die, 50,000 dying out of 300. You see how that works? Yeah, in which case it's death rate is no longer 5%. Um, yeah, the significant quote from this article in Miami Herald written by David J. Neal is, the 10,059 confirmed new novel coronavirus cases from Sunday's Florida Department of Health update the third highest single day total behind Saturday and Thursday shot the state pandemic case numbers to 211,000. So the significant information that you should take away from that particular quote is that the three highest numbers were on Saturday, yesterday, and Thursday, a couple of days ago, and today. That's the most significant information you take from that quote, meaning we haven't reached the peak. It's still going up. That's why I'm predicting 
that a million Americans will die by end of August because cases are going up. Death will definitely go up. And if you run out of nurses per patient, if you run out of ventilators, you run out of PPE, you can't even have 100% of the new cases ending up in death. New cases which come to the hospital. Yeah. That's why I think I, I, I am being scientific to predict 1 million. Because at a certain point, death will exponentially grow. Once you run, run out of PPE, you can double the death numbers in a couple of days. Uh, or even a day. Yeah, so you, you have to expect that. You know, remember, one third of the world population died during the Black Plague. So this is not new. If one third of the world's population died from COVID, you cannot say it's the first time that happened in history. You can't say it. Because there are pandemics that killed one third of the world's population several times in past history. So you're not special in that regard. You're not making history because one third of the world's population died from COVID. That's happened before. It's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, yeah. And don't doubt that that could happen. None of the scientists are doubting that can happen. It can happen. World Health Organization is saying, even if you're infected with COVID this summer, you could get it again next summer and die from it next summer. Yeah, and Dr. Fauci said antibodies do not confer total immunity. Like you may be immune for a few days, but you may not be immune after that. So you could get COVID this summer, survive, you could die. Uh, after getting COVID during Christmas time. That's why this is a scary thing. That's why I don't think you should doubt that one third of the world's population can be killed by COVID. Um, second article, 121 University of Washington students infected in Greek row outbreak. Greek row is like a rows of Greek houses. Greek meaning um, fraternities, right? So you have fraternity row, like they have houses where fraternity brothers live, and there's a row of them. And it's just like a dormitory, you know, it's not really that different. Uh, so let's say at Georgetown University, you have college dormitories. You know, people are living in the dorms, you're walking in the hallway, how are you gonna avoid them going to the shower? The hallways are very narrow. So COVID-19 is gonna spread like wildfire. There's no way you could avoid it because when you're walking in the hallway, they're so narrow, you cannot have a six feet apart. It's impossible. The building is not designed to have six feet apart walking in, in the dormitory hallway. That's why, you know, if you open uh, Georgetown University for fall, you're gonna have thousands of cases and maybe hundreds of Georgetown students dying from COVID in the fall, from flu season. Um, the significant article from that, and which is NPR, uh, it's written by uh, Rachel Treisman, is uh, the quote, the University of Washington announced on Sunday that at least 112 fraternity house residents north of its Seattle campus have tested positive for COVID-19, bringing the total number of students infected on Greek Road so far to 20, 121. The nine additional students who tested positive were close contacts of the residents, but do not live in the fraternity houses, according to a statement from the University of Washington. So maybe they're girlfriends, like women who crashed their party. Um, yeah, so that's coming in the fall at Georgetown University, George Washington University, American University, Howard University. Marymount University, George Mason University. So that's something you can look forward to uh, when the semester starts, if you don't close down campus. Obviously, here at Christian Kim, independent candidate for US Congress for the Virginia's 8th District. So it's safe, better to be safe than sorry. Better to be safe than sorry. And do not open it. Do not open the campus because once you open the campus, then you're opening the Pandora's box and thousands can inf get infected, hundreds can die. Do not open the Pandora's box, right? I mean, how stupid do you have to be to open the Pandora's box? 
you must be a complete idiot if you want to open the Pandora's box, right? And that's why I'm saying colleges must close for fall semester 2020. Why would you want to open it? Why would you want to open it, the campus? Doesn't make sense. Um, there's no vaccine, there's no cure. Now the 20s are getting infected, massive numbers. And we're gonna find out in weeks to come and months to come, the kind of damage it's gonna do. And obviously we can't know the long-term damage because you need time. So people who get COVID now may die uh, 13 weeks later, like Nick Cordero. We just don't know, or 23 weeks later. And nobody has even studied whether you could get cancer from COVID-19. Because sometimes virus can cause cancer. Can, it has secondary damages that it does to your organs and your cells. Nobody knows what kind of secondary damage it does. So even if you're asymptomatic, you may not die now, but you could die a few months from now if it's triggered by something. Uh, herpes virus is triggered by certain uh, stress or temperature conditions, and you have an outbreak in your body. Uh, so that could happen with COVID. No one knows. Scientists just don't know what COVID does. Um, like, like some viruses, this may trigger other conditions, um, like cancer. Cancer is just your cells growing abnormally, your own cells growing abnormally. That's what what cancer is. It's not like something outside of your body. Uh, but it could be triggered by a virus that impacts your DNA creation mechanism. And this is an RNA virus, so it's, it does impact your DNA creating mechanisms. Um, yeah. The third article is Kanye West says, I am running for a president uh, as Elon Musk says, you have my full support. So Kanye West, the famous the singer, um, and a devout Christian by his own testimony, is running for Congress. And, you know, um, let's see what happens. You know, as I said, if President Trump supports LGBTQ rights, you must vote against him. And I will encourage you to vote against him if, he supports LGBTQ rights. I'll encourage you to vote against them against November. If President Trump comes out and says, I support LGBTQ rights, I will encourage you to vote against them. And in fact, every Christian should vote against them. Now, you can't vote for Joe Biden uh, because he's an LGBTQ rights supporter as well. I mean, I mean, I'm not as well because President Trump, from what I understand, opposes LGBTQ rights, but if he comes out as supporting LGBTQ rights, Two rights, we all must oppose President Trump because we must serve God rather than men. Now, if Kanye West comes out and says he opposes LGBTQ, he opposes uh, abortion, then I say let's vote for Kanye. Because in the eyes of God, the one who follows the word of God is always the better political candidate. So if President Trump says, I want to illegalize abortion, but I want to protect gay rights, then you have to oppose President Trump because gay rights is far more serious than abortion. If you have to choose between abortion, uh, illegalization, gay, gay marriage illegalization, you must choose gay marriage illegalization because that's a priority in God's law. That is more important uh, than murder. As I said, because murder is not as serious of a crime as homosexuality in the Bible. So if you have to choose between two, like if you had to choose one to illegalize, you have to illegalize homosexuality. That is a priority. That's why that's my campaign promise number one. So if President Trump says, I want to illegalize abortion, but I will support gay rights, then we all must oppose President Trump. Obviously we cannot support Joe Biden because he supports gay marriage. So we can't vote for Joe Biden either. But if Kanye says, I want to illegalize gay marriage, homosexuality, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
if Kanye says, I want to illegalize abortion and I want to illegalize homosexuality, we should all vote for Kanye. Simple as that. Uh, obviously, you know, um, let's see. Why do you think Kanye will make a worse president than uh, President Trump? I mean, he's a highly competent individual. Kanye, look, you know what he has accomplished? He's a self-made man. He used to work at Foot Lockers, from what I understand, right? He worked, like, for minimum wage, like, you know, fitting people's shoes, like Al Bundy in uh, Married with Children. And then he started rapping, and he made himself into a famous singer. He created a music empire, and then he created a clothing line. I mean, he diversified into clothing. He kind of became like what Calvin Klein, an African-American Calvin Klein. I mean, you know how hard that is to do? Did he get an MBA to do it? No, he did it without an MBA. I mean, he's, you know, obviously a person who can make himself into a famous singer and then create a clothing line that becomes a multi-billion dollar business uh, can run a country. I mean, he's like the black Trump uh, who's not in real estate industry, but like in, you know, music and, you know, clothing industry. His wife, Kim Kandashian, I think she's a uh, Armenian, Kandashian, Kandashian, I think it's Armenian. Maybe she knows like my friends in, in Glendale and Pasadena, like Michael Motassian, you know, my, my uh, best buddy, uh, Oh, he, he was, you know, he, he was an undergraduate, you say, my best buddy from uh, UCLA, uh, who worked with me at Student for Christ at UCLA. Uh, and um, Ara Kundakchian, who was a master's student at UCLA when I was a PhD student. Maybe she knows them, <laughs> you know? Because Armenian community is kind of small. You have like hundreds of thousands in Pasadena and Glendale. They know everybody. So <laughs> she probably knows like, you know, my Armenian friends. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she cr created a perfume and um, cosmetic line that's like multi-billion. So, you know, these are competent individuals, you know, uh, from, from worldly standard. And, um, you know, uh, Kanye wants to honor Jesus and Kim, Kim Kardashian as well. So I don't know why anybody would would think that they are not competent to run the country. I mean, I mean, obviously, I voted for Trump in 2016, and I'm planning to vote for President Trump in 2020. Unless he supports gay rights, then I will not. 100% guaranteed, vote for President Trump. I will vote against him. I'll write in someone else if I have to. But obviously, if Kanye runs, then I'll throw my support behind Kanye. You know, if he says, uh, I, I oppose gay marriage, homosexuality, and abortion. Other issues are not that important, really, for Christians. Um, I mean, obviously, I have issues that I care about, but the most important thing is abortion and gay marriage. Those are two determining factors, uh, because do you want to have another COVID-19 if we ever get out of this? Yeah, that's why. Um, yeah, so I... Hey, Kanye for president, if he opposes homosexuality, he wants to illegalize it, he wants to illegalize abortion, go on record to do that. And if President Trump supports gay rights, hey, I, I'm not even gonna think twice, I'll vote for Kanye. And I encourage every Christian I know, every non-Christian I know to vote for Kanye. If he says he wants to illegalize gay marriage, homosexuality, and he wants to illegalize abortion, and President Trump supports gay rights. Yeah, I guarantee you. Um, why shouldn't Kanye be president? You know, maybe it's God's will that he becomes president. I mean, you can't judge people by their cover. I mean, I think his cover looks good, but some people may say, well, you know, uh, Trump looks more, you know, presidential. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if people say that or not. But um, I think Kanye looks fairly presidential to me. So. I mean, there isn't really an image of who the president is. Once you get elected to the president, 
you know, you you are the president, so you're presidential, right? You know, I mean, it's like when you go to prom, you don't you don't go in like sneakers, right? You wear like a tuxedo. So you may be like a gangbanger, you may be a rapper uh, who's never won tuxedo, but you you wear your tuxedo to the prom. You know, then you look sharp, you look good, you like anybody who wears a tuxedo. So I know a lot of people like to judge people. You know, I came from the hood, right? I, I grew up in Logan, Philadelphia, which is like all African American when I was growing up. I was like the only non non uh, black person in my street. Um, you know, and so I have a particular appreciation for black people, and I appreciate the fact that a lot of black people are very good evangelical Christians. I, I respect that about black people. Um, and if Kanye is faithful to the Bible and opposes um, homosexuality and abortion, why shouldn't he be president? I don't see any problem with him becoming president. And there's no reason to say he can't do a good job. I mean, what, what are you basing that on? It's like prejudice, right? Um, like before President Trump became president, did you think they would do a good job as president? I thought that based on the fact that he made this real estate empire out of nothing, I thought he would make a good president and I'm proven right. I think President Trump is a very good president. But same with Kanye, he, he, he started with nothing and he created himself into a music icon and then he created a music empire and then he created this clothing empire, you know? Uh, and his wife is just as smart. <clears throat> So I have no doubt if he becomes president, he'll do a good job. I, I, I mean, I like you know, I, you know, I like President Trump as long as he opposes gay marriage, homosexuality, gay rights, LGBTQ rights, and abortion. I'll vote for him in the fall. But if not, I'll definitely vote for Kanye if he's in the race. I mean, you know, like CNN is like laughing at him and saying, "Oh, he says he's going to be president, but hey, he has done nothing." I mean, you know, people are mocking him already, you know, and it's kind of sad because like kind of shows how prejudiced they are, you know, like CNN. Um, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is whether, whether a leader submits himself to the word of God or not. That must be the most important thing, because look at what's happening to America because of COVID. Who cares if Supreme Court justices have PhDs from Oxford, like Kavanaugh, or like JD from Harvard Law School, if they're going to anger the, the living God, whereby he sends COVID-19 that kills 130,000 Americans. I mean, I'd rather have somebody who went to like no-name law school, got a law degree, become U.S. Supreme Court Justice, if he or she would steer us in the direction where we are not going to experience the wrath of God. So, yes, degrees don't matter. The most important thing is, are they going to make the right choices that's going to bring our country in compliance with God's law so we don't suffer the wrath of God? I think that's a priority, whether it's the Supreme Court justice, whether it's the president, whether it's the senator, whether it's the House of Representatives member like me, that's why I'm running for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District, vote for me on November 3rd, or a mayor or governor or state legislature, city councilman, county board member. I think the most important thing is, are they going to come in compliance with God's law so we as a people don't suffer wrath of God. I think that's the most important thing, don't you? I mean, geez, look at what's happening because of COVID-19. We could have avoided all this if five years ago, Supreme Court Justice who have these Harvard degrees did not submit to Satan and allow gay marriage. We would not be having all this suffering and death from a spiritual angle, from a theological angle. Because if God exists, obviously you got to account for God. I mean, you say you believe in God and you're like, you act as if God doesn't exist. You think God's like a, an idea that's in your brain just to hold on to when you say, oh, somebody loves me, God loves me. You think that's, no, God is a person. We say three persons in one. And he has his feelings, he has his will, he has his likes, he has his dislikes, he acts. That's what makes him a person or God, uh, a, <clears throat> a being. and not an idea. He acts. 
on his own volition, on his own will. So why do you live like God doesn't act? The God doesn't have preferences. God doesn't have likes and dislikes. He's a living being. And you are made in the image of God. So if you have things you like and you don't like, you can deduce from that, <coughs> excuse me, on a logical level, <coughs> that God has his likes and dislikes. You're a rational being. You need to use your critical thinking about God. Do you want to survive COVID-19 or not? If you want to survive COVID-19, you got to use your critical thinking about God. You're not going to survive COVID-19 if you don't use your critical thinking skills. Yeah, so I'm going to provide you with information you need to survive. Because um, I want you to survive. I want your children to survive. It's very important that you survive, right? Because that's so you could do more things for God, for example. So I created this show to help you survive. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed my show today. Uh, this is a daily show, so check in uh, tomorrow as well. Watch this show. Um, yeah, so I'll bring you more information tomorrow that will uh, deepen your insight and understanding about the world around you. And I'm the Leonardo da Vinci of 21st century. There's no question about it. And those of you who see this show, have seen this show for a while, understand that to be absolutely true and self-evident. You, you, know, um, you know that's a self-evident truth. And so, um, yeah. Uh, so check back tomorrow. Tell all your friends, those you love, even those you hate, you don't want to die from COVID, right? To watch this show every day so they could survive. You gotta watch the whole show from the beginning then. There's a lot of information that you need uh, to survive COVID-19. Survival is work. You need to work to survive. You can't survive sitting there eating bonbons, doing nothing. So um, yeah, so uh, watch this show. Take notes if you need to, uh, so you don't forget some of the important things that you learn. Yeah, so um, I hope you, you survive, your children survive. Encourage your adult children to watch this show as well. Sometimes we discuss adult topics, that's why I say adult children, you know, because I need to discuss all the issues, uh, and some of the issues are kind of, you know, more adult specific, um, but we need to discuss them, because obviously all aspects of human life must be discussed. Remember, you could die by August. You could die by Christmas. This is not time to live a fake life. It's not time to live a lie. We are faced with existential crisis. You will die if this keep goes on at the probability that is very high. It could even be one in three. Um, yeah, so let's be honest, let's do what is right, you know, you know, as I said, I did not make God's law, right, if I were God, you know, I don't know what I would have done, but because I haven't really thought of myself as God, because I don't want to anger God, because he sees my thoughts, I don't want to think like I'm a God, you know, because <laughs> God's a jealous God, you know, God says he's a jealous God. You know, you have a jealous God up there. You don't want him, you don't want him upset. So yeah, I'm very careful not to make the jealous God who is God, who said he's jealous. He told us he's jealous. Uh, so I don't want to make him upset. So I'm not going to take things away from him, you know? You know how jealous people get. And God said he's jealous. So um, yeah, that's why I didn't create the law. I didn't create the rules. I'm just going to follow it because this jealous guy gets really upset when you don't follow his rules, his laws. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's why I'm, I wanna help you as well. <laughs> you know, as I say, you know, I follow the Jesuit tradition, Cura Personalis. I wanna help you survive COVID-19 physically, through healthcare, through mental health, through emotional survival, social emotional matrix, uh, environmental matrix, but, also a spiritual matrix because spiritual world is real. 
Why do people act like spiritual world is like fake? No, spiritual world is more real than your real world because God is everywhere. God sees everything. God is omnipotent. So that world is far more real than any physical world you can see. Do you see? That's why I cannot ignore the spiritual dimensions because cure up personality, cure up personalis, treatment of the whole person requires this. You cannot survive ignoring the spiritual reality. You know, um, yeah. So I want you to survive because I'm going to bring the spiritual reality in that is more real than any physical world you know. Now, yeah. you've been in the academic, you've been in the workplace too long, you've been in the world so long, you've kind, kind of like lost touch with the Bible. You need to get back into the Bible, understand what the Bible says about God. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'll bring you more information you need to survive COVID-19. So tune in tomorrow. Uh, yeah, if your husband and wife, it's a good idea to watch it together and discuss, you know. Um, yeah, and then um, kind of break things down for your children, your non-adult children. Make sure you pass on the knowledge, right? That's what makes you good parents. You, you learn something new that's important, and then you teach your children uh, kind of in a way that a parent will teach their children. But you need to pass the information on to your children whether they're five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, it's your job as Christian parents uh, to teach your children what is right. So pass it on. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I hope that you will be well. And that I hope that your family will be well too. Um, and see you tomorrow. Bye.